So what if you could see into the future? What changes would you make now to affect the outcome that you want in the future? If we look back, we know how things happened. There's a series of events that occurred to make you get into this room right now where you are. You walk down the hall, you may have gone up the escalator. There's a series of events that occurred to get you to right over here. The same thing happens with your infrastructure. The current state of your infrastructure right now is because of a series of events that have occurred. Now, there may be uh, different generations of, uh, of technology that you have in there. There may have been uh, mergers, acquisitions, layoffs. Uh, there may have been failures, patches, many different things that have evolved to give you your current infrastructure state. So I have a question for everyone to think about while I go through my presentation, and we'll get to it at, at the end. Knowing what you know now about how your infrastructure has evolved, what would you have changed back in time and when you had the chance? If you had the foresight to see the evolution of your infrastructure, what decisions would you have made architecturally to have a different outcome? So I'll tell you a bit about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Damon Bear. I work for uh, Scalar Decisions. So we are a, a VAR uh, up in Canada. Uh, I'm also the, uh, or at Toronto, uh, VMUG uh, co-leader. I was also a uh, VMUG co-leader for, for Vancouver as well. So I try to get around Canada as much as I can. Uh, I'm also uh, an author of a book, which is coming up, which I'll talk about uh, at the end of the, the presentation. I'm also uh, a double uh, VCAP, uh, soon to be a VCDX. And I am a V-expert NSX and a Nutanix technology champion. So some of the organizations that, uh, that, that I work with are um, uh, national uh, financial organizations, uh, government service, power distribution, healthcare, medical. Now these are the types of, of organizations where having availability and security goes beyond the SLAs. These are organizations that have an obligation to the, the general public. They need to make sure that their environment is, uh, or they, that they are, are accountable to the public for, for their in environment, and that it's uh, available, secure, and it's able to be audited in, in such a manner. Now, one similarity between all these types of organizations is that when they, they do design of their environment, they use frameworks. So why do we need to use a framework and what is a framework? A framework is a method of doing things that has structure. It's a methodology. It's something that you can use that's uh, repeatable and you can take it and you can apply it to multiple situations. But the key thing is that it's a guide. It's a way to direct you to think in a certain manner. It's not a law, it is flexible. But by following the structure of a framework, you're able to come with a consistently successful uh, outcome. Now there's a, a number of different frameworks that, that, that are out there. Uh, uh, TOGAF, the Zockman framework, uh, as well as on, on the uh, um, uh, service delivery side, there, there's ITIL and a bunch of other ones as well. The reason why it's important to have a framework is not for when things are working well, it's but when things go bad. If you have multiple critical failures, if you have no budget, if you have no additional resources or staff, a small problem may turn into something that is catastrophic. And if you don't have a structure for the way that you're going through the design, that is, is, that is very easy for a catastrophic thing to, to happen. But if you go through the process of using a proper framework in order to design your architecture, you are a lot less likely to have a critical failure that uh, could put people's uh, lives in jeopardy or put a company out of business. So the VCDX methodology is such a framework. It, it borrows a lot from uh, enterprise architecture and a, a number of other um, uh, frameworks out there. And Although the VCDX method, methodology is uh, geared towards 
people that are pursuing uh, excellence and expertise within the VMware stack, it's actually applicable to any type of architecture out there. So some key design characteristics of um, the VC, uh, VCX methodology are uh, availability, manageability, performance, recovery, and security. Now, if you take these, you can apply them to every single component in an infrastructure. So let's just say, for instance, if we were looking at just compute uh, on the availability side, um, you would have to think about things such as uh, in internal redundancy within, within the hosts, uh, is there redundant power, um, is there redundant connectivity, uh, is there HA or FT being used? On the manageability side, you have to think, how are you actually going to manage the environment? Are you strictly going to use vCenter, or are you going to use PowerCLI? What about um, uh, SSHing in, into to a box and using a, a, the DCUI? IP KVM, Ruby, um, or a, a third-party uh, management tool that, uh, that uses the, uh, the APIs in order to do that. So there's many, many different ways that you can manage the environment, and how it's actually managed needs to be uh, considered for each component of your environment. For performance, you need to think about things such as uh, uh, how many uh, um, uh, cores and sockets do you have in your, uh, in your hosts? Uh, what kind of uh, memory configuration do you have? How does that uh, map over to uh, um, uh, the NUMA considerations that you have? And how do you size your, your, your VMs accordingly? Uh, for recoverability, you have to think about things like if, if your hosts go down, what's involved in, in bringing them up? Are you using uh, auto-deploy? Is it stateless? Are you using host profiles? Do you have uh, an installation script that, uh, that you use when you go through the, the deployment process? Or do you use a, a deployment server in order to do your, your actual uh, installations? On the security side, are you using lockdown mode? Or do you have certain concerns around uh, a PCI or, or SOX compliance that you have to apply over to each one of the hosts? And if so, how are you actually going to, to do that process? Are you going to go through each host and do a, a best effort attempt, or are you going to use a, a configuration management system in order to, to do that and make sure that they're, uh, they're done properly and then uh, auditable? Also, who has access to, uh, to the, the environment? And what, uh, what level of access do, do they have? Do you have uh, AD integration? Do you have uh, uh, local accounts? So these are many, many different, different considerations, and I'm just going down a few on the compute side. You can do the same thing for, for network, for storage, um, for uh, all the different parts of, uh, of your environment. Now, the considerations for design allow you to think about what are the main drivers for, for the design itself. You know, what are the uh, uh, requirements? What are the constraints, the assumptions, and risks? For the requirements, you may think of uh, things such as um, are five nines required? Um, or do you have to have uh, indefinite data retention for, uh, for your environment? Uh, for your, your constraints, perhaps there's an existing vendor relationship. So your design has to be based on a specific vendor because of, of, of that relationship. So that will limit the, the possible things that you can do with, uh, with your design. Now, assumptions are, are interesting because a lot of the times they're completely made up and they're put in place because you don't have all of the, the answers to uh, a certain problem that you're trying to solve. So, for instance, if you have an environment that uh, you're building um, um, an infrastructure for, and it's, uh, or the current data center that, uh, that is being used is uh, at max capacity, and, and you're building a large addition to that environment, one of the assumptions that you'd put in your design is that more space needs to be made available, or perhaps a second data center needs to be available for that. You have to make sure that you have adequate staff that can support the uh, environment, uh, as well as uh, budget for the, the investment in that, um, in that project. So these are all things that are assumed. And when you're going through the, the design process, these assumptions are often the beginning of a dialogue in between the, uh, 
the client and the uh, the architect itself. If it's internally, then it's more of an internal discussion. But if it's uh, a service company and, and a client, then it would be a dialogue back and forth. But it creates the discourse by putting the, the assumptions in there. And often, it may change over a number of different iterations until you get to an equilibrium of what the assumptions actually are and what is the truth with, um, with the client. On the risk, risk side of things, you have to consider things such as uh, if you're putting the environment into um, a brownfield uh, situation where there's existing equipment and you have to leverage some of that, will the additional load be able to run on the environment without causing other outages or, or impact? Uh, what about the timing of, of, the, uh, of the project? Is there enough time to actually do what needs to, to be done? Or what about the solution itself? Have you actually gone through the validation stage to determine that the solution that you want to put in there is actually valid for the, uh, the, the problem? Has there been a POC in place? Uh, you know, have you gone through the, the, the rigorous testing that is required to ensure that whatever solution is put in place is production ready and production capable? There's a number of risks that are often missed. And risks are usually the weakest part of an architecture design, and, and they're usually thought of as uh, a last thing, something that needs to be added to a document, and they're, they're not usually core to the uh, architectural analysis itself. And I, I was thinking about this. How can people actually start to look at all the risks that, that are out there and then start to use risk in, in a different way to design the infrastructure in a more intelligent manner? So the first thing I thought of is component failure. Component failure is one of those variables <coughs> that is usually uh, addressed after the fact. Uh, either it's done through having spares of equipment or you have uh, SLAs in place with, with vendors so that uh, you pay a whole lot of money so that the, they're there within two hours or within four hours. But that's more of, a, of, of an afterthought. That's not having foresight into actually understanding when things are going to fail. And I didn't find any way within uh, the, the IT world that really addresses this. So I started looking at outside of the box. And I came across, in the medical field, there is uh, something called a, a survivability analysis. And uh, this uh, um, method right here is using the, uh, the, the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And what it's actually measuring is if you have uh, an ill patient that will eventually die, and you apply a treatment to that patient, how will that change against the control patient over a period of, of a course of time? So in, in this diagram over here, we have a, a control which is in red, and then you have the treatment which is in uh, blue in the top, and you can see that that change it would extend the, the, the period of, of life of the patient for that specific time. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's done, it doesn't, it really depends on, on what the treatment is. So I was thinking, this is interesting, but how can we really apply that to, to IT? What would you consider the treatment to be when you're looking at, at infrastructure? And if you think about every environment, every environment is slightly different. There's different um, environmental concerns. There's different workloads that are running on the environment. If you look at uh, a site that is, is running in a mine, for instance, they may have issues with uh, uh, dust building up in, in the systems or, or through the HVAC, uh, different heat concerns. Um, if the equipment is higher in, uh, in elevation, like up on, on a mountain or in a higher region, then you have to worry about uh, the, um, the failure rate at that specific altitude. So there's a number of, of different things that you can uh, consider, but each one of these different scenarios you can consider to be a treatment. And components that are running in, in that environment, you can start mapping them out against controls so that you know that if you're going to bring in a hard drive or a motherboard or a certain type of server into that specific environment based on the past, you know what to expect. 
So this is not something that you can necessarily just apply right away. It's something that needs to be taken as a strategy over a longer period of, of time. But once you start building up that, that um, uh, body of, it, of information, then you can do analytics on it, and, and you can treat it as a, as a big data problem to determine where you're going to put your, your resources, where you're going to put um, your, um, your money. Are you going to change the actual uh, equipment that you put in these different locations based on the, uh, the survivability analysis of the components? It's possible. It may end up saving you money. Uh, you may be able to optimize your environment a little bit more for, uh, for doing that. So this is one of the methods that you can do to plan for failure. Another method is by using defense in depth. So defense in, in depth will allow you to have different types of, of failures and you can still keep on, on running. Or you can have it automatically repair the, the environment. One example of this is uh, with the fail fast application architecture. If you have a services that have a certain uh, rate of response or certain latency, and if they stop meeting those thresholds, then it's possible to uh, reinstantiate that service so that it comes back up, up over to a base level. This is a, actually a, a very, very popular with uh, organizations that use uh, cloud native apps. Um, uh, Netflix does this uh, a lot, actually, where they will keep on restarting their instances until they, they get the, 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 the best performance. Um, but this can be done on uh, many different types of environments. You just need to have the ability to uh, do the introspection on the, on the services and understand the thresholds so that you can make that uh, happen. Uh, if you have uh, an application clustering technology in place where you have multiple servers and you can balance the load of the incoming requests against that, then you're able to make use of, of this technology. Uh, another one is uh, fault-tolerant uh, components. So having... Uh, um, let's say uh, RAID 1 on boot drives or having uh, multiple uh, power supplies, uh, having uh, enough components in there that if you have a failure, it's not going to take down the environment and then you have time to replace it. It, it just wouldn't be service impacting at that point. So that's uh, another method that you can use. Uh, or using high availability software, whether it's uh, VMware HA or uh, another solution, so that if something does go down, there's only a few minutes until that actually comes back up. Uh, ingress and egress load balancing making sure that the network traffic that's, that's coming in is balanced uh, through load balancers uh, coming in as well as going out. So by, by distributing, distributing the, the load, you're, you're not only uh, removing your single point of, um, of failure, but you're also creating a, a more um, uh, scalable environment. And application level clustering, which is kind of what I was talking to, to before. Ah, there we go. Now, graceful degradation is another method that you can do that you can use. A graceful degradation is when you have a failure, it doesn't take you down, but it removes some of the functionality that you can do. And by building an environment so that you can have multiple failures but still run is very very critical in um, in, in certain uh, industries. In this diagram over here, this is uh, an Air Canada Airbus. It's actually the, the, the plane that I flew down on, uh, which is kind of funny. But the interesting thing about the Airbus is that if you look at the flight control systems that are, that are on them, it has five different flight control systems. The, the first three are completely identical. They have the, the same software on them. They have the... Uh, uh, the, the same code, the same components, but it's not just single redundancy. You have triplicate redundancy in those flight control systems. But then you have a secondary flight control system that is based on completely different technology. It uses different components, different software, but it functionally will do the same thing. The reason that they do it this way is so that if there is a bug within the system or something that can take down the entire architecture of the primary flight control system, you're still able to fail back over to the, the secondary, although the controls may be a, a, a little bit more limited, uh, you don't have the, the same sort of features, you'll still be able to land the plane and um, you, you'll do it in a way that's not going to cause any, any harm to people. 
Now, risk mitigation, I often don't like the way that, that it's done. See, risk mitigation will prevent the worst of what is known. So if you have a potential problem that you know about, there, there may be uh, something that's, that's done to make sure that if, if that happens, it's, it's, it's limited. But there's n often not a lot of deep insight into beyond that. It's usually just a single level of failure. If this happens, then we'll do this. If this happens, then we'll do this. The problem with that is that what happens if you have multiple failures? What happens when you start having cascading failures? What happens to all the different subsystems that are affected by that initial failure? So I'll talk to that in, in the next slide. But with root cause analysis, root cause analysis is, is done whenever there's a failure or an incident, and it allows you to determine what was the actual cause of, of, of the issue, uh, what can be done to, to repair it, and what can be done to ensure that it doesn't happen again. It is a, a critical process that needs to be done. However, it only looks backwards. So if you're trying to increase the availability and the robustness of, of your environment, you can only do that with a root cause analysis if you do it uh, uh, iteratively. You have to fail a lot of times in order to get a really strong infrastructure. So another method that you can use to determine what um, systems can be affected by a failure is called fault tree analysis. So if you map out all the different components in, in your system and you see what are the dependencies of this component and what are the dependencies of, of that component, you can actually map out if this fails, then okay, that's going to affect this system. And if this system fails or is affected by that because of additional load or so on, then it's going to affect this system. And these systems together may come together to actually take down one of, of your uh, really important systems in, in your environment. So once you map out all the different parts of your environment and what happens when you go through these uh, cascading failures through the fault tree analysis, you can determine where you actually need to spend your money. If it's just as simple as... Um, bolstering or adding a bit more money over to uh, components one and two, then you save yourself from a disastrous uh, issue that, uh, that may have brought down an entire environment. And you haven't changed a lot, you just have a better understanding of, of where things can fail and the dependencies in between them. Now, event tree analysis is another way that you can look at, uh, at failure. So if, if you were to think about um, well, in this instance, uh, we're, we're looking at, at, at mail. If, uh, if you take all the components of, of a, a mail service, you have mail, DNS, the, the network, MX records, and then you know, finally the, uh, uh, the, the service that received it at the end. Now, if each one of those components were, were to fail, then you have, um, you have a, a fork or you have a different path that, that it can take. So by mapping out the path between one area to another, and looking at all the possible scenarios of a failure, you can see what the final outcome would be. So on, uh, on the right over here, you can see that out of all the different consequences, uh, you have a number that are okay, a number that, that are delayed, and a whole load that are lost on the bottom. So in this diagram, the key uh, path of divergence is actually over on, on the DNS section. So if you have a failure on the DNS side, it doesn't matter what happens after that. <clears throat> you're, going to, you're going to lose the mail that, that's, that's coming through. So the, the critical uh, point of divergence is the DNS. So by understanding that, then you can start putting more um, effort into making sure that your, your DNS environment is, is uh, more resilient. If you didn't go through this process, then you wouldn't necessarily know the ramifications of, of what would happen by having these certain failures. Now, another concept is the, the concept of uh, technological disobedience, which is making things do, or making things do what they weren't designed to do. Now, an example of this is uh, back in the 1990s in, in Cuba, after the Soviet Union pulled out, 
they did not have any resources coming in. They didn't have any uh, equipment, technology, or appliances or anything coming in. They had very, very old uh, uh, equipment and um, appliances and, and, and so forth over there. And one of the, the key fixtures in just about every home was this uh, 1960s era uh, Soviet uh, washer and dryer, which often what would happen is that the, the dryer side of it would break and then you'd be stuck with just the washer. So you'd have a half broken machine that you couldn't really do anything with. So what people started doing is they would take the, the motor out of the uh, dryer portion and then they would start using it for, for different things. So in the, the picture over here, you can see that um, uh, one thing that was used was it was, it was changed to, uh, to be a sander, another one's a home fan, another one's to use uh, as, a, as a cabbage cutter. Um, or a key copier, a shoe sander, or home juicer, all sorts of, of different things. So the necessity allowed for the innovation. And what the government started doing at the time is they were seeing the innovation that was being done by all, all these, these people around, and they started to put together a, a book, which um, was called uh, uh, Con Nuestros Propios Esfuerzos which means with their own efforts. So they put together this book of all the different hacks and uh, you know, backyard engineering um, projects that people have done uh, across the, uh, the country, and then they released that over, over to the public as uh, a big manual of basically how to, hack your, uh, how to hack your home with nothing. So that concept uh, really intrigued me because I think that a lot of parallels can be used on the IT side uh, of things. And the, the similarities would be people that, or organizations that uh, either don't have uh, the, the budget or they, they don't have the, the, the time in order to, to purchase new equipment or they, they, they don't have the authorization or they decommission some equipment and then it ends up sitting in their warehouse and they don't exactly know what to do with it. So if you can break down the components of what you have uh, available and look to see what you can really use it for as opposed to what it was previously used for, you can understand how to optimize the, the waste of environment. Also, if you understand what happens when you have a fader that you're not able to fix, then you can plan for um, a strategy to use those broken components to bring yourself back up over to uh, a workable state. Uh, the, these are the type of considerations that um, the uh, scientists use when, when they send uh, uh, like the uh, equipment over to, uh, to Mars and to the moon and other planets. When things start failing, what can you do in order to take what you have, rebuild it into something that's actually usable again? If we look on the other side, what if you want to build something that's completely indestructible? You have to think about resiliency, availability, redundancy, business continuity, recoverability, and there's a lot of considerations. And it's not impossible. You can definitely make something that is virtually 100% indestructible, but the main limitation is cost. If you have unlimited funds, then yes, you can make something that, that will never break, never be down, never have any risk. But that's just not possible. Nobody can do that. Cost is always an, a, an issue. So then the topic from um, indestructible goes over to robustness versus what's defined as anti-fragility. So robustness means that you build up an environment, you bolster it, you make sure that there's no single point of failure, you put in the, the money to, uh, to uh, compensate for any issues that, that occur. Now, anti-fragility will allow you to, it's a concept that allows you to understand what's going to happen when something fails, what's the probability that, that, that uh, something is going to fail, and then develop a strategy for that failure. Are you going to use that as uh, a fulcrum to change technologies? Or are you going to run your, your environment uh, until 
you uh, can no longer afford it, and then you're going to use that as a strategy, strategy to change something else? Or are you going to go through the, uh, the process that, that I talked about back over here, where you do the, uh, the decomposing of technology in order to bring an environment back up? Ideally, it's good to have a combination of, of these different sorts of, uh, of methodologies. First, you need to identify where your weak points are by going through the, the fault tree analysis process, by going through the event tree analysis process, and then you can determine what you need to build up, what you need to protect. And you can do that in the most economical way by understanding what the effects are with all, all the different parts of, of the environment. Then you can also have a plan for failure and determine what strategy that you're going to use when, uh, when that occurs. So all the stuff that I've talked about so far is uh, uh, something that I've been working on for, for a couple of, of years. I'm actually in the process of, of bringing out uh, a book that talks about these sort of things. And it's called uh, Designing Risk in, in, uh, in IT Infrastructure. And it's actually part of, of uh, a series of books that uh, are coming out right now uh, from the, uh, the IT Architect series. The first book is out, and uh, you probably heard of it. It's, it's called uh, Foundation in the Art of Infrastructure Design. It's uh, written by uh, three uh, VC VCDXs, uh, John Rashid, uh, Mark uh, Gabrielski, and, uh, and Chris McCain. Uh, and it, it's a fantastic book if you want to get a foundation of um, uh, what's required in order to become an architect, the, the thinking process that's required to get yourself up over to uh, the, the VCDX level, or just having a better understanding of, of, of enterprise architecture. I'm writing the, the second book, um, Design Risk in, in IT Infrastructure. That's going to be coming out in, in the first quarter of, of 2017. And there's a, a third book, um, which is on a hybrid cloud by uh, Brandon Han, and uh, that's actually called uh, Your Cloud or Mine. And that'll be coming out in uh, 2017 uh, as well. So uh, thank you very much. And are there any questions? No? Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.